Hello gardeners and thank you so much for watching Mid-American Gardener. We love coming on and talking about all things that are topical to right now. So if you have a question, we are going to answer that as well as other things. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. So I'll talk about maybe cut flowers, maybe perennials, but there are three specialists here and they may be the ones who know everything. So I may turn it over to them and let's find out who's here. So let's start first with you, Ella Maxwell. Hi, I work at Hair Nursery. I'm a horticulturist there and my specialty may be trees or perennials. And today I have a viewer email about a uh, identification of a plant. And uh, they were hoping that we could identify this plant, and we have the picture. And what it is for barb is it's a type of cotoneaster. It's a commonly referred to as hedge cotoneaster. And uh, it's cotoneaster lucidus, gets to be about eight to 10 feet tall and wide. And I also brought in some books here. These are uh, a manual that we would use uh, when I was in school mm -hmm. that um, will help us identify some of the different plant material. And these are really great reference books and that's what helps us identify is the fact that we do have material that um, you can use. So this Forest Trees of Illinois, this is a really nice one because it gives the bark and the fruit, it shows the different areas in the state that you might find this out in the woodlands. So there are lots of great reference books out there as well. And so that's how we learned about the Ketoniaster. And the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants was Dr. Durr, and I think yes. three-fourths of us had him uh, no, no, at only least two fourths of us had him. <laughs> but we all use that book. Yeah, and it uh, yes, is everyone across the country, well, in the central and eastern part, mm -hmm. I think, use it because they're plants that we can all identify. Okay, so Dave and I had Dr. Durr, but. Yeah, yeah but, he left right when I came. But Darn. we had his references from then on. Thank you, Ella. And now let's go to Dave Plussard. Thank you. I'm Dave Plussard. I'm the garden center manager at Hare Nursery in Peoria, as well as a certified arborist. So I can pretty much answer tree, shrub questions and some of the gardening questions. And one of them that I have here is an email from Richard who says that he has eight raised beds that he started about 15, 20 years ago. Now he has grasses kind of creeping in and he's wanting to know that there's any way that he can use some sort of chemical treatment to be able to uh, get rid of the grass that's growing in among his roses and his perennials. And actually there is a chemical solution that you can use. I brought uh, two samples in. Uh, this is Grass Be Gone by Ortho. It is one product that will kill your grass without hurting your uh, flowers and roses, things like that. Uh, this one is similar. It's not the same chemical though. This one is over the top by Fertilome and it likewise will kill the grass without hurting the plants. This particular one is also can be used in some vegetable gardens. So it's labeled to do both. Uh, but you have to make sure and read the label with anything that you are using because uh, Grass Be Gone, for example, would not be used in and it is not labeled for a vegetable garden. But these are two options of ones that you can use and do read the label because it doesn't control uh, or it's not safe to use with all plants. You're going to maybe want to test it and see how it does before you just go around spraying everything. Yeah. Very good about reading the label because, oh, that could be heartbreaking. Yeah. Very much if so. you just think it's going to work well and it kills everything. Thank you, Dave, very much. And I'm going to go next to you, Karen Ruckel. Hi, I work also at Hair Nursery in Peoria and uh, primarily shrubs, perennials, a little bit of house plants. And uh, what I wanted to, to, to talk about was with right now fall cleanup and, and fall cleanup, I think, is going to be early winter cleanup with how long every you know the season kind of has stretched out this fall. But when I was in school and we learned about different perennials and woody plants and how fantastic the spent blooms and the seed heads, how beautiful they looked in the winter and frost on them. So I brought some of um, 
these plants that, 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 that everybody talks about how beautiful they look in the winter landscape. And this is what I prune out of my yard. I do not like brown flowers. I don't <laughs> like this in my yard. And so this is what I actually cut out and remove. Um, some of the plants, it's just practical because um, like this grassy one here, some winters it does reseed. And so that's just kind of then it becomes a weed. So removing that in the fall, so I don't have to look at it through the winter works out well for me. And the hydrangea blooms, I, once again, I just don't like brown. So I <laughs> cut off, I don't do pruning per se in the fall. I don't prune back plants unless the herbaceous perennial has died all the way down to the ground. But I don't like the brown heads on there. So I, I just clean it up and ha have tidier, what I like tidy. What I garden for is I like colorful flowers. And so um, this is why I garden. So that's why, you know, at the end of the season, I'm, I'm not out in the garden in the winter. I'm not looking at, at the, the spent flower heads. So this is why I garden. And I just thought it was really funny because we're in November and how much was still blooming in my yard and that was annuals. And I even have, um, just because it was there in the yard, some raspberries that were ripening. So I stuck them in my little bouquet. That is just amazing. You have that much color still in your garden. That is wonderful. You know, and, and we've gotten, we haven't gotten a hard freeze. Mm -hmm. And so it's just amazing um, what what's still kind of lingering. Um, you know, a lot of the perennials kind of stopped. And a few, uh, like the daylilies thinks it's a new spring. Yeah, it it's, seems like they're pushing some flowers. Yeah. Karen, very well done. I like that you have an opinion. <laughs> I noticed that Karen has an opinion, and so that's what's great about gardening. We can all have our opinions. <laughs> Sometimes with the science, you can't just have an opinion, but you can have an aesthetic opinion. Yeah. So good job, Karen. <laughs> all right, let's go to our Did You Know feature next. Did you know that mosquito repellents don't repel? The spray blocks the mosquitoes' sensors so they don't know you're there. Mosquitoes are also attracted to the color blue more than any other color. Okay, let's go next to the phone lines and let's go to line two. And I think it's a tomato question. Hi there. Yeah, I know it's a little late in the year for tomato questions. So That's okay. My question is uh, when, you, when you have tomatoes that come out watery instead of you know, nice and meaty. I'm, I'm thinking of four factors that might, you know, it could be uh, the location where they're at, could be the weather, could be the variety, could be the time of year that they're ripening. What do you think is the biggest factor if you're getting watery tomatoes? Well, I think a watery tomato is a flavorless tomato. That's what you're referring to, correct? Yeah, they just, uh, when you slice them, all the uh, juice wants to run out, and they're just not firm and tasty like normal. But. Well, I think you've already answered your own question with some of the reasons that you thought. And um, I think a lot of times, my personal opinion is, uh, if you find a tomato with a great flavor, continue growing that particular variety. I don't think that they're that specific to the weather necessarily. I think it's more of a varietal um, difference. I was thinking varietal too, some of the meatier ones, and, well, and I, I you think, might ask around. I think I, I know that the tomatoes I stripped off late this season and I brought in because I thought it was supposed to freeze, and then I was gonna take them to Ella and I forgot to bring them over to her. Though They seem to be very thin fleshed compared to the earlier mm -hmm. tomatoes and not as tasty. So maybe, you know, along with what you were thinking, weather. Heat. We right. didn't Lack have as many heating degree days, and tomatoes like heat. Tomatoes and basil, which I usually plant together, like the heat. So we didn't have as hot, yes, of uh, summer as usual. Not for the tomatoes, but just for the comfort. So you might ask around people, who, what do they like as their favorite varieties, and try some of those. Thank you very much for your question about tomatoes. It's always a good time to ans ask tomatoes question, tomato questions. Let's go to Chuck's question on line three about an oak. Hi there, Chuck. Hi. What's your question? I, I, have, I have two pinup trees in my front yard, and one of them uh, turns yellow on one side, and some of my friends told me that it was lacking iron. So I put some iron on it, 
but uh, in here, in the fall here, it's been losing my leaves on the side. It turned yellow, and the other side still has leaves. And I just wonder what's going on. Well, okay. pin oak are uh, known in our uh, Central, Illinois, Central Illinois area as not being able to take up the iron that they require. We have uh, just kind of gets tied up in the soil. So very often you have to uh, add the iron uh, in a form that's called chelated and that means that it doesn't get tied up to, to, in the soil and it becomes available to the tree. So you can do that either by adding it to the soil or you can have a tree service injected into the trunk for you. Uh, another source is to possibly try and lower the pH of your soil because trees, uh, oaks tend to like it a little bit uh, on the acid side. However, it's really kind of a losing battle with pin oaks. I remember Dr. Durr telling mm -hmm. us uh, in school that 80% uh, of the pin oaks in our uh, Central Illinois area are going to have this yellowing problem because of lack of iron and and the, eventually it doesn't matter how you much iron you add it's not going to help the tree that much so once it gets to a certain mature level um, what you add to it probably will not make that much difference and it, it's just very difficult as the tree gets bigger and bigger to provide what it needs. So I guess enjoy it as much as you can right. at the stage it, it is but thank you for that question Chuck we have heard quite a few things over the years about pin oaks and it's still the same all right let's go to Kay's question on line five about some flat or about some seeds hi Kay hello uh, good evening to everybody I'm calling concerning uh, some wildflower seeds that I received this fall at the state fair from the wildflower their wildflower seeds they came from Conservation World, mm -hmm. and the lady at the time told us that we could put those out in the garden right now and plant them, that they would come up come spring. Is there anything special I should be doing to to make this happen? Or Well, you would want a prepared seed bed, so you want to have it cleaned off. But in planting these in the fall, uh, they will probably not germinate, and they just uh, would uh, benefit from the cooling, this cold right. temperatures. And once they're in the soil and you probably lightly cover them, uh, they should be fine until spring, don't you think? I know people that even will put it on a light snow mm -hmm. and have it, you know, but it's on a prepared seed bed usually. Yeah. But, and the other option is to do it in the spring, but you can do it if they need that stratification or cold treatment, that's probably why they said to plant it now. Okay, so already thinking planting flowers, that's great. Let's go on, uh, line six, Maggie has a question about weeds in iris. Hi, Maggie. Hi, uh, I have fall bearded iris, probably about 40 different kinds of named iris and some dwarf iris, and I put some miles on my bones, so I can't keep up with the weeds and grass anymore. Uh, so I was wondering if there's something I can put on these iris um, that can control the weeds, you know, that I can put over the rhizomes. I heard you talking about the uh, grass be gone and over the top. By, um, and I was just wondering if those would work or if, what, what I could do with that problem. Well, the, the two that I showed are specifically for grass that is already existing. So if you have uh, cleaned out your bed already, what you really want to use is a pre-emergent. So something like preen, um, it would be what you want to use. There's usually two or three different products that are available for to control the weeds before they actually start coming up. And you'd have to check the label to make sure that they can be used with iris, but I, I do think Treflan, which is in preen, is okay to use. There are, the Dimension is another one that's available for the garden and it will control not just some of the grassy weeds, but it will control some of the broadleaf weeds. So uh, basically, again, read the label. When you go to get it, make sure it's okay for iris. And if so, then you can uh, lightly spread it in your garden and that will control the weeds that you're trying to keep away. Is Dimension a pre-emergence or is it? It is a pre-emergence. Okay. Yeah. So if she has grasses that are 
rhizomatous or coming up, she's got a little more difficulty? Yeah, that's a good point. If, if the weeds that you or the grasses you've taken out, if they tend to spread by uh, underground stems or stems along the surface, uh, if, you, if you get rid of the grass but you have not gotten rid of, of those um, underground stems, the rhizomes or the stolons, the, um, it's the pre-emergent is not going to control those. It only controls any weed seeds from germinating. Actually, I think she needs to really check the label because I don't believe that over the top or the uh, grass be gone can be used on iris. But her, she's talking about after they're taken care of. I don't think she was. But oh, she wasn't? Oh, then I'm I misunderstood. Sure. We and, disagree. <laughs> and the other thing, sometimes with that, you know, the grass that goes through, it'll get in and around the rhizomes. It's sometimes very difficult to get rid of grass. Uh, I, I think like that, that growing them in a raised bed is mm -hmm. maybe the better way. Transplanting some, mm -hmm. saving the ones that you really want to keep, and well, you need to you need to, uh, especially your tall bearded iris. You need to dig them up and mm -hmm. take the old ones out and replant them anyway. So that's going to do a lot to control the weeds. I think she was not wanting to do that, but I think you're right. <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> the way to go. All right, let's go to another. Uh, Turf question, and this is line four with Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Uh, hi. I'm so glad you took my call. You're welcome. I have a grass cutting question. Um, my grass right now, which is right before winter, is in real need of being cut. And I don't want to cut it because I think if I leave it long, it will protect the grass. Is Am I wrong, or should I go and cut it? Well, I was mowing my grass today, uh, so mm. did she have, Did she say regular grass? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, I would mm -hmm. go ahead and cut it back. I would not uh, leave it real long, but you can mow it in the two to two and a half inch range, I think is what they say for winter. Mm -hmm. Maybe go two and a half. The, the reason that surely you would cut it is that you don't want it to <laughs> flop over, hold a lot of moisture. You can get some uh, winter uh, fungal diseases. Uh, happening over the the winter if the grass is too long, so cut it. Okay, good question, Shirley. Thank you. Now let's go back to our emails or show okay. and tell. We'll start with you, Ella. All right, I had an email from Roger in Decatur about a uh, plum tree that he had planted, and he sent us a picture about it. And uh, he wasn't sure if the damage was from insects or possibly a disease. He even had deer nibbling on them. So again, the idea with this is that um, those holes from the picture that he's given us on plum trees, many of the fungal diseases, it's uh, called a shot hole fungus, where the um, the dead brown part actually falls out and then you think, oh, an insect ate it. So again, for fruit type trees, there are some uh, special sprays that would give both insect and disease control that could be applied on a regular basis. But again, the picture that he sent us is showing a, um, a possible disease or insect problem that I feel is primarily cosmetic in mm -hmm. nature and don't sweat it. Okay, very well spoken. Okay, okay. let's go to you, Dave. Let's, You've got oh, your let's go to you question. Next. Come on. I'm sorry. Let's go um, to you next, Dave. This, this particular email, uh, we have to show the picture of it. It's about uh, identification of a growth on a swat, swamp white oak, if we can identify it. And this is what's called a gall, G-A-L-L. -L, and it's a growth. Uh, in particular, this is caused by a wasp. And the wasp will lay eggs, and they cause the hormones of the tree uh, to uh, produce these growths around the eggs for the insect to uh, grow and then will come out of these growths. Oaks are really known to have galls. There are 
hundreds of kinds of galls or even books written on identifying all these different types of galls. Uh, they're generally, most of them don't do any particular damage to the tree. You don't have to do anything about them. If you want to, you'd have to cut them out. Uh, the only way, other way to do it would be to spray to control the wasp um, just at that particular time that's laying, which is early in the spring. And it's usually not practical to spray a big tree. And uh, U of I generally does not provide recommendations for those because it's just too impractical and really doesn't do that much damage. That was a trophy looking gall though. Yeah, that was pretty cool. quite interesting. I don't think yeah. I've seen that particular one. Thank you, Dave. And now Karen. I've got a question that was emailed in by uh, Bridget from Tinley Park, and she's got a Rose of Sharon that is not growing straight anymore because of uh, shade, and um, it's it's getting heavier, it's growing the wrong way, and there's not a lot of room to stake, but she doesn't want to cut it back. So the problem when you've got a plant like that, Rose of Sharon actually is a little bit shade tolerant, and I've seen it doing pretty well under other trees. But if you've got it growing more toward a light source, unfortunately, you are gonna have to cut something. Either you're gonna have to cut back what is shading it, if that's bigger trees above, limbing them up or taking that canopy up further to let more light in, or you are going to have to cut back some of the happier part of that plant that's growing and getting heavier and, and tipping the plant over to compensate for that side growing a little bit more. But um, you know, you see a lot of people with hedgings, hedges of, of Rosa Sharon and, and they're still quite happy. So pruning it back will not injure it, but I think that'll help take some of the weight off because it, it is growing to one side. Okay, very good. Now let's go to the phone lines again and we're gonna answer Lute's question on line two about bagworms. Hi there. Hi there, good evening. And good what evening. is your question? <laughs> I had two cases of bagworms, one on my weeping maple this summer and just recently on my knockout roses. What is mm. the best way to get rid of bagworms? Well, if they're actual bagworms, they're pretty easy to control. Uh, the best way on these smaller bushes is to pick them off and step on them or Absolutely. crush them. Make sure you kill them before you throw them away. Otherwise, you throw them in the garbage can, they'll just crawl right out. But um, real bagworms can be sprayed. Some of the organics will control them. You can use some of the old fashioned chemicals as well. They're, they're very easy to control. Some of the very safe pesticides will control them. And uh, generally you do that when they're young, which usually they come out uh, kind of toward the end of uh, May, June. So that's when you start watching for them. Father's Day. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to go to another question and let's see if Tom has a good quick question for us. Line three. Hi, Tom. Hi, thanks a lot, Diane. Hey, this is a great question. Um, I've got some hibiscus that I bought from uh, one of the, uh, the farmer's gardens here mm -hmm. about five years ago. <clears throat> some of them I have found, like I had seven of them and now I've got five. Some of them will keep on reproducing year after year and some the other ones died off. Is there a difference between the perennial and the annual in the hibiscus? And your mulch problem from last uh, week that I talked to you, it raised my nitrogen like crazy, but now the hibiscus are all taken off. Hmm. Okay, who wants to do a primer on hibiscus? I'm looking at Karen or Ella. Okay, or well, Rose. hibiscus. Uh, for hibiscus, you have the tropical types. They are not winter hardy. They're only an annual. You grow them on your patio. You can bring them inside as a house plant. Then outdoors, Karen had the question about Rose of Sharon. That is a type of hibiscus, as well as the perennial hibiscus, which uh, dies back to the ground every year. And we think that's what you're talking about. And um, that sometimes can have some winter injury. It's very late to come up in the spring. And uh, usually though, they're, they're quite hardy, uh, but they're difficult to propagate. It's hard to dig off a side shoot. That's what, all I know about hibiscus, Diane. So if, if there were seven, and five are still left. The two it just could have been 
sometimes you get mechanical injury because people think they're dead when they don't come up. Well, could be I environmental. Had, I had some hibiscus and the voles ate them. So mm -hmm. I had uh, five and I only had one this year come up. So uh, there are little mouse type um, animals called voles. They live underground and they will eat on the roots of grass and, and flocks is one and they do not eat, um, what was the one plant they didn't eat? Um, wow. Oh, daffodils they didn't eat. The daylilies they didn't eat, but they did eat my hibiscus, which was very uh, disturbing. Well, if you have them, or were they all in one spot? They were in one part. Okay section of the garden yeah I have oh mine, the hibiscus yeah yeah i have mm -hmm. mine all throughout and so hopefully if one gets it they won't all get it yeah but probably you have the hardy one and two just didn't make it so thank you so much for your questions we love our audience they have great questions and it we really targeted our uh, our group here and what they what they are expertise what their expertise is in we want to thank each of you for watching and you three for being here and we'll sure. see you next time have a great week gardening goodbye